Townhouse Pond, uh, Northeast Pond, Milton Pond, are important to Milton because they're Milton's jewel. You look at every bigger community. You think of Boston, you think of the Boston Commons. You think of New York City, you think of Central Park. You think of Paris, you think of things like Eiffel Tower. Well, now this is no Eiffel Tower, but it is a natural environment that a Boston and New York wish they could have. It is the jewel, one of the jewels that makes Milton what Milton is. My name is Chris Jacobs. I'm currently the town administrator for here in Milton, New Hampshire. I've been a resident since 1994. What these ponds provide to residents and visitors today is different than what we used to think they offered. We used to think that it was just fishing and swimming and boating, water skiing, things of that nature. But I think post COVID-19, we've come to realize that places like this provide uh, the ability to decompress, wind down. So they're really, they're really necessary for our, I would say, survival, mental survival, physical and mental. I've heard it expressed many times by town officials and by others that the Milton Three Ponds are the economic engine of Milton, uh, in part because it attracts tourists to the town beach, in part because property values are, waterfront property values are uh, higher than if the lakes were not here. But uh, I mean, I, 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 I think that uh, if, for example, these ponds weren't protected and they aged prematurely, they lost value, there would be a tremendous reduction in the, in the uh, income and the revenues from taxes uh, that the town would no longer get because property values would be fine significantly. The people are attracted to this area for its natural environments. And, and that's where it has that natural or ripple effect where it affects everything within government and within society. And, you know, today the dollar decides, the dollar directs. So if we keep the pond clean and vibrant, it'll respond, if you will, with a positive economic impact. Nobody wants to swim in dirty water, polluted water. They don't want to see things floating by them in the, in the water body. So, for us to stay healthy and vibrant, I think the lake has to stay healthy and vibrant too. I'm Jim Haney, and uh, I'm from the University of New Hampshire, a professor there in biology. Uh, we actually, in our lab, began the Lakes Lay Monitoring Program that's now active on Milton Three Ponds. And uh, we, we tend to do a lot of work with lakes and with water quality and also right now with cyanobacteria and their toxic effects. Well, the Milton Three Ponds has had a program for over 25 years now. So we were able to see, in fact, some of the weaknesses as well as the strengths of the, the lakes. One of the things about Milton Three Ponds is the three ponds are very different and the three ponds respond quite differently. And so what we've learned is that although in general, the water quality is intermediate, and has been pretty stable. It's gone through some periods where it's, it's, it's varied. Uh, but one of the things we've also learned is that it's susceptible to change. My name is John McFedrin and I work with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection where I lead the Invasive Aquatic Species Unit. The invasive species that we know in Milton Three Ponds is a plant called brittle naiad. That's the common name. There are actually several common names for it. The scientific name is Nias minor. It's a plant that is not native to the United States that was brought here years ago and is now being moved from water body to water body by like most likely by human activity, possibly by animal activity. Invasive plants can alter the habitat of a lake by crowding out the native plants, which may be growing near the surface, midway up into the water column, and then at the surface. So you have kind of this diverse assemblage of plants growing. 
I have seen the brittle naiad on uh, Northeast Pond growing very densely, big kind of clouds of the plant late in the season that preclude any other plants from growing there. So it can change the habitat. We do see effects actually on property values. We've seen that, it's been documented on Lake Arrowhead in Maine with the infestation of a different plant, variable water milfoil, but where the assessment values of properties along the lake were actually lowered because of the impact of that infestation. There are, uh, in Maine, there are 11 listed plants as invasive and New Hampshire has a few more than that listed. And any of those could become a threat to a particular water body. So the main thing is to inspect watercraft before they go into lakes and after they come out of lakes to remove any plants found because you can't be absolutely sure that it is not an invasive plant. With respect to how Milton and the Lebanon communities and all the communities within the ponds are dealing with this, we've done it through the TPPA first where the Three Ponds Protective Association has developed a weed watching group to survey this and assess the amount, size, scope, and degree of which the plant has populated the lake. And number two, we have contracted not only with a herbicide treatment in the most uh, heavily populated your invasive species areas, but we've also got a DASH, Diver Assisted Suction Harvesting contractor that is coming along and harvesting via suction batches of the plant where it's thick. In terms of what would happen to the pond if we ignored the naiad, it somewhat happened to our northeast pond. For years, the naiad must have flourished and it flourishes in a depth of up to 15 feet it grew into a 40 acre patch where no other plant life was growing. And it will continue to do that if left untreated and unchecked. And it will overtake the pond. It can grow in sand between rocks. It is a very hardy plant. It can grow in depths sometimes greater than our native species. With respect to what people should be doing to protect lakes, we really should be thinking more broadly and think about not just the aquatic plant threats, but also threats from animals like zebra mussels or Asian clam. And some of those organisms have very small microscopic phases called a villager phase. They can't be seen and they might be in bilge water. They might be in uh, a live well water. So the technique or the approach that we're pushing for all boaters to follow is something called clean, drain, and dry. Clean anything off of the boat, the motor, the trailer, drain the bilge, drain live wells, and ideally dry everything for five days before launching in a new water body. Drying for five days is often not possible for many people. So we encourage them to clean, drain, and to, to the extent they can actually dry surfaces with the towel to try to prevent the spread of these invasive aquatic organisms. Most people are usually pretty awesome about cleaning their boats. I've only had, I can count on my hand the number of occurrences where I've had to take something off of a boat such as a plant and kind of be like, you know, you can't do this. You can't have a plant on the back of your boat, but usually people are pretty great about having their boats clean. I think it's important for people in Milton and outside Milton to care about keeping the ponds clean. It ensures that our future generations have somewhere to come and enjoy and make sure that it's clean for everyone to come and enjoy as well. James Houle. I'm the director of the UNH Stormwater Center. Stormwater affects the ponds because as places develop, we implement impervious surface. We say impervious surface is, you know, the roof over our heads. We want that to be 
impervious to rain, you know, for natural reasons. It's also the roads we drive on and all the structure that kind of, kind of supports civil society, alter, that alters the hydrology. And so what happens when you go from a undeveloped to a developed condition is these surfaces replace grass and meadows and forests and the resultant hydrology means more runoff, less infiltration, less evaporation. So that more runoff is fine if the runoff isn't, isn't carrying pollutants. But oftentimes pollutants collect on these impervious surfaces because we drive on them. You know, they, they, they're good collectors of these different pollutants that threaten the health of the uh, ponds. So the most common pollutants from a stormwater perspective would be uh, sediment. So we call that total suspended solids. These are uh, particulates and other particles that also accumulate other pollutants. They can smother aquatic habitat and you know in, in general it's not such a bad thing but in large quantities um, it, it, you know it can be harmful. The other pollutants of course that we're focusing on are nutrients and when we say nutrients it's nitrogen and phosphorus because excess nitrogen and phosphorus uh, can lead to eutrophying cycles within the uh, pond itself. When I say eutrophying, eutrophying is just the Latin word for excessive growth. And excessive growth is great if we're talking about our kids, <laughs> but not so great if we're talking about harmful things in, in the water. So what made me get involved in water sampling is the realization that our being here is gauged by the health of this lake. Uh, if the lake goes bad, then our opportunity to enjoy it is gone with it, as well as all of the properties around the lake losing value as well. So it's important for us to keep track of what's going on in the lake, mitigate where we can, and just understand from time to time uh, what the lake's telling us. What we learned from testing in the water is uh, the clarity of the water, the uh, safety, the uh, bacteria content of the water. Uh, it, it allows us to have some confidence in whether or not we want to use the water for recreation or if we just want to look at the water. Uh, our goal is to use it for recreation, so we want to keep on top of all of the bacteria and uh, different testing that we need to do for it. So the effects of these pollutants I guess it's important to start off in saying this doesn't happen overnight. And you've probably heard of the term death by a thousand cuts. And this is kind of the, uh, the scenario that we see, uh, particularly with stormwater. Um, you know, if you go back 50 years, the population around the ponds was probably limited and certainly it didn't reach the density that it reaches now. But as the population increases, as the density increases, more people I mean more vehicles, more um, you know, trash and debris and other things. And when it rains, that's a great delivery mechanism for those types of pollutants to the water body. And so as the water body gets overloaded with those pollutants, you start to see just uh, unnatural cycles, right? So things that fall out of balance. So not doing anything is just like a plan for uh, allowing um, the ecology to fall out of balance and you're basically signing yourself up for future outbreaks of E. coli and beach closures and you know thing, things that are uh, more emergent and more difficult to deal with like cyano, cyanobacteria and the attendant toxins. So techniques to manage stormwater again in addition to erosion there's little um, depressions that we can create in the landscape. Uh, we call them rain gardens. It's not unlike, um, you know, a regular garden. It's just you're building a depression uh, probably somewhere in the area where water could, could collect. It could be around a downspout from your rooftop, maybe that's going into an area and you're giving water a place to go and a chance to soak in the ground. And then again, that keeps water on your property, uh, lessens erosion and also the water gets clean as it moves through the soil and feeds the plants. 
is there an economic cost by not maintaining or keeping clean the lake? Certainly there is. And if people coming to our lake don't take the time to make sure that their fuel cans are secure so they're not spilling fuel, that they don't have an oil leak, that they've checked for those um, invasive species plants to make sure that their villages are clear, we're, we, they, us, we're all gonna pay the cost to continue to have to work to clean up the mess to uh, reverse the damage that was done. If you generate trash, you're supposed to take it back with you, take it home and responsibly recycle it and get rid of it. The boaters, the vacationers, the swimmers, the fishermen with their gear, we all have a part to do to be stewards of the lake. So I think we have lots of uses for the lake. But all of these then depend upon maintaining the high quality. And once you use them in a way that diminishes that quality, then they're not going to be as useful. And in some cases, perhaps in most cases, once you go down that road, it's much harder to bring them back than to maintain. So I think the, the lesson is uh, we should treat them with great care because uh, they're only here uh, in this, this condition as long as we maintain them that way. We all have to do something to be part of the solution it's for our future generations. Let's face it, Milton only has one set of ponds. We can't just spoil it for our own benefit today. We have to do our part to preserve it.